1972 marked the beginning of change for the series. The first is Zol's successor, Dr. Shinigami. He's played by Hideo Amamoto, someone we've seen before on my channel, having first seen him in... Godzilla's Revenge. Yeah. But he was also in King Kong Escapes, where he played the film's villain, Doctor Who. Apparently, Kamen Rider is after he regenerated into yet another mad scientist that's fond of wearing Dracula's cape. Also, since Paul Frees isn't around to do any English dubbing this time, we can hear his natural speaking voice. Shinigami's monsters are cyborgs like the rest of the series, and he's very much a mad scientist, but he also adds a mystic aspect to Shocker by way of weaponizing hypnotism. On a few occasions, he uses it against Taki to either evade capture or to subdue him instead. Because of course that happens. But more ominously is when he uses it as a brainwashing tactic against children. Yeah, Zol wanted to raise kids into becoming shockers. Shinigami prefers hypnotizing them into doing it. Ironically, my favorite monster that he creates, Bear Conger, has nothing to do with hypnotizing anyone. Instead, it's a super strong bear monster with a unique design. It appears to have goggles built into the mask instead of eye holes, and has a limited vocabulary similar to Egyptus. <laughs> I do like how it's both a humorous monster and a threatening one, as he breaks Hayato's arm in the middle of a fight and hog ties him while riding on a snowmobile, one of the funniest images in the whole show. Of course, the appearance of Shinigami also marks the return of an old friend. Guess who's back? No, not that old friend. He wasn't even born yet. Episodes 40 and 41 reintroduce Hongo to the show as he teams up with Hayato against Shinigami's first two monsters. It's really satisfying seeing these two. Those contrasts I brought up before result in them working well together. Easily some of the best fight choreography of the show comes in episodes where they team up. Wait, what's that here? Did Hongo and Hayato just do their own version of the Revice Remix forms? <laughs> Whatever, this was definitely where a lot of effort was put on Toei's part, and it paid off. Episode 41 in particular, the Magma Monster Ghoster, Great Decisive Battle of Sakamajura. Shit, these titles are getting longer. Was the highest rated episode of the original series at 30.1% viewership, beating out the series average of 21.2. This was Kamen Rider at its most popular. After this point, Hayato would remain the protagonist of the show until episode 52, at the end of which he and Hongo decide to switch roles, with Hayato fighting Shocker overseas while Hongo stays in Japan. It's an entertaining episode where Shinigami's plan involves using, well... <laughs> that said, the transition between our two leads is kind of rushed. You know, kind of like last time. They don't discuss this prior to the final scene, and there's not much of a transition between what we saw the first time Hongo reappeared and his decision to stay. Other than I guess Fujioka was fully recovered by that point. Truth be told, he's gone on record saying he was dedicated to the role, pushing himself hard to recover because of how much kids loved the show. That might be why kids do the same Oni-chan thing to Hongo that they previously did for Hayato. That isn't to say Hayato is gone from the show, however, as he becomes the one who shows up during two-parters. Him swooping in and saving Hongo often makes Hayato come across as more of a badass than when he was the protagonist. It's weird to think that only now Hongo shares screen time with Taki. It's easy to forget they technically met all the way back in the early days of the show. Remember, half the reason Taki was introduced in the first place was because Hongo's actor wasn't on set. Regardless of protagonist, Taki slides into the role of Hongo's backup the way he was for Hayato. And as for Tachibana, to say he's happy Hongo's back would be an understatement. In fact, Hongo's appearances in future media make this scene tragic in hindsight, as all signs point to Hongo becoming a full-time common rider after this series concluded, meaning their shared dream of Hongo becoming a professional motorbike racer never happened. On a more positive note, episode 53, The Monster Jaguar Man, Decisive Deadly Automobile Battle, must have been a point when the show's budget increased. Here, Hongo gets a new suit and bike that he gets to show off in a sequence that ends up having more motorcycle action in it than the entire Reiwa era up to this point. A transformation sequence of his own is introduced. <laughs> Does that look like it was at least partially dubbed in post to anyone else? 
as if Fujioka only said Henshin while on set and had to add the Rider part later. Whatever, it comes with a new look for the Shocker Combat Men, solidifying into the skeletal pattern that they will have for the rest of the franchise, and a new villain general is introduced, Ambassador Hell. He's played by Kenji Ushio, notable not only for this role, but also for being the first actor to play General Hedda on Battle Fever J, at least for the first seven episodes of said show. Afterwards, he got arrested for illegal drug possession and had to be recast. Ironically, on Kamen Rider, it's Hell's successor who gets his people hooked on drugs. I'll talk more about the Ambassador and how he fits into all of this, but first I have to say, I appreciate that Hongo and Hayato have better quality costumes, but unfortunately they now look too similar to one another. So similar that when Hayato reappears in episodes 72 and 73, Tachibana doesn't realize it's him at first. Their color schemes were more unique with their original costumes, and I think I preferred it that way. A nice touch is that the suits look less like the kind of monster Shocker would create, and more like a superhero. The kind of hero that children like Goro look up to, showing how far both characters have come. It reflects how the show has changed over time from being moody and atmospheric to being more colorful and bright. It's a bit odd that Hongo, the first common Rider, has two stripes running down his outfit, while Hayato, the second common Rider, has one stripe. Switching gears back to the villains, you may be wondering what happened to Shinigami. He too still pops up from time to time. Unfortunately, he and Hell share screen time in only one episode. Despite hinting at a potential conflict between the two, <laughs> at no point do the villains come to blows. For the remainder of Shinigami's time on the show, either he's commanding a Monster of the Week, or Hell is. For early plans for the series were originally going to have Shinigami turn into a Saw Shark monster, and the costume for said monster has some reminiscence of the original idea, in the form of having the same high collar as the Doctor. But history ended up repeating itself as Fujioka was once again unavailable for filming the episode where this costume was used. It's one of two episodes actually, 66 and 67, and as such, the Saw Shark monster is used as a regular monster of the week. And instead, it's episode 68, where Shinigami unveils his finalized monster form is based on a giant squid. Revice's viewers may have figured out by now that Ulteka takes after him. As for Hell's tenure on the show, he is perhaps the most traditional of the original show's villains. He speaks in a dramatic way, exaggerates his body language, laughs a lot, and gets irritated at his monsters more often than his predecessors. I'm surrounded by idiots. One of the episodes Fujioka's absent from involves Hell performing a magic ritual to summon a graveyard of dead shocker monsters back to life. It certainly conflicts with my earlier theory about how Shocker typically brings back its monsters, but it's consistent with other aspects of Hell's character, like his habit of using Bond villain-inspired death traps. Or maybe I should compare him to a 60s Batman villain, given he's the one who leaves clues behind as to who's responsible for all the subliminal messages everyone's been hearing on the radio recently. Katsuyoshi! On the subject of this stretch of episodes, it's here where our heroes make an ethically questionable decision, forming the Kamen Rider Youth Squad, an organization consisting primarily of kids who scout out all of Japan in search of Shocker, then send word to the Tachibana Racing Club via Carrier Pigeon. Don't look at me like that, it was the 70s people, they couldn't exactly text Tachibana or something. Though I shouldn't have to tell you how reckless this is given all the kids involved look like they're no older than 10 or so. Of all the things the show could have done to give Goro a bigger role... Oh, wait. That's right. Episode 62 has him introduced two friends of his, Naoki and Mitsuru, who take his place as the kid appeal characters for the show after Goro vanishes, much like the various members of the racing club, without a trace after episode 65. Remember Yuri, the only one of the ladies who actually sticks around? She's his older sister, so you would think Goro would at least get name dropped. But then again, neither has Ruriko or Hiromi since they left the show. Or Mrs. Taki, so forget about it. Instead, the youth squad becomes Naoki and Mitsuru's thing. Which one is which is easy to forget, however. They don't have much personality, and because they act together all the time, it's hard to feel like they even are two separate characters. And if one of these kids looks familiar, it's because, like Amamoto, we've seen him before in Godzilla's Revenge. Well, 
At the very least, Common Rider is a few years later, so the kid has some time to grow. Not to mention there is no terrible dubbing this time around. <sighs> at least Toei is responsible enough to tell kids watching the show not to try this at home. Speaking of which, the ladies become glorified secretaries at this point, listening in on the youth squad's communications, and that reminds me of something especially stupid. Remember how Ruriko was kept in the dark about Hongo being a writer? His reason being he didn't feel human anymore and thus kept it a secret for fear of rejection? That may have made sense early on, but now the common writers are well-known figures all over Japan. Kids in universe are seen playing common writer on the playground and even singing the theme song for fuck's sake. I'm just saying, I doubt the characters would look at Hongo and Hayato and go, Ah! Monster! If they knew the pair were the common Riders. But no, gotta keep them out of the loop. Even as this group gets kidnapped by the villains more frequently than the previous arrangement of Yuri and Friends. Now as we go through this series, I'm sure you've noticed the many shakeups in an attempt to stay fresh, which is good for any series, especially a long one. I admit it's here where the length of the show can start to wear, which is why I suspect there's so many shakeups in the 60s to 70s episode range. While I'll never get tired of seeing monsters riding around in normal cars because that's funny, I suppose there's only so many times you can watch Shocker create a new type of poisonous gas or acid powerful enough to melt a person. Don't forget about the combat men clumsily falling off their bikes, making me fear for the suit actors given the show's track record. Not to mention getting killed by the monster they're working with just as much as they are defeated in battle with the riders. Monsters casually killing adults, while children always manage to be spared so they can be used as hostages instead, or get away, or are rescued at the last second. Not to mention a recurring plot where Taki gets a lead on a secret meeting between all of Shocker's global leaders, including their great leader, only for it to turn out there is no meeting and it was all a trap. You're going to see all of this. Repeatedly. Though there are some cliches that you might be familiar with in the franchise that are absent, mainly because they were introduced in future shows. So here in the original series, you won't be seeing a monster that isn't truly evil, or the villain generals fighting the writers in their monster forms on a regular basis, or even a glimpse of said monster form until their final battle. You definitely won't see Hongo and Hayato switching between different forms to battle the monsters. The upgrade the two do get is not because it's the culmination of a story arc, which in turn promotes a new toy, it's because the show got a higher budget. And there's also no love interest for either of our main characters. Maybe Ruriko was intended to be at some point in development, but any possibility of that left with her. And our heroes don't get involved in any romance plots, not even with guest stars. Well, okay, there was that one time Mari tried flirting with Hayato early on, but he shut her down pretty quick. <laughs> This is a relatively big chunk of the series, giving Ambassador Hell a lot of screen time, though it's his final two episodes where he really gets to shine. As one of his plots is proceeding as normal, a second monster with a name I have no idea how to pronounce, so let's just go with Crab Bat since that's the rough translation, suddenly attacks Hongo out of nowhere. And Ambassador Hell doesn't recognize it, becoming suspicious of the Great Leader's motives when he tells the Ambassador it's not his concern. There's a simple explanation for that. Yeah, shots fired, I know. This leads to a major change in episode 79, where Hell leaks a word about a shocker plot to Hongo, leading the Great Leader to order his execution, even inviting Hongo to watch. This leads Hongo to rescuing Hell in order to get more info about Shocker, but it turns out Hell's still loyal to the organization as a whole, kidnapping the racing club members before having his final battle with Hongo in the desert. And despite dressing up like a cockroach for the whole show, Ambassador Hell's monster form is based on a rattlesnake. And for some reason, he's the only one of the original villains that doesn't have a counterpart on Revice. I just kept waiting and waiting for a rattlesnake dead man that just would not show up. As for the Great Leader, this leads to the biggest change to the status quo, in theory. Episode 80, Gel Shocker's debut, Common Rider's Last Day, sees the Crab Bat monster killing all that remains of Shocker's forces. Years later in Common Rider O's, we'd see a former combat man who survived the slaughter, though Crab Bat for some reason goes unmentioned. Things get confusingly worded, or potentially confusingly translated, as we learn the Great Leader has joined forces with another villain organization, Geldum. They say this leads to a merging of Shocker and Geldum into the organization Gel Shocker, though in practice it feels more more like the Great Leader has abandoned Shocker, taken over Geldum, and rebranded. 
The disconnect between what the characters are saying and what is happening on screen is odd to say the least. Is it poor writing? Poor translation? Poor understanding on my part? It's poor something because now it's time to address the final villain general of the show, General Black. He was the person in charge of Geldum before the merger, and Black's face twitching throughout the show made me think he was chafing under the Great Leader's command. But ultimately, he maintains undying loyalty to the Great Leader from the moment he appears on screen to his dying breath. Furthermore, Gel's Shocker episodes frequently come across as if they're running through Shocker's greatest hits, General Black doing his own take on the plans his predecessors attempted without a shred of irony. Gel's Shocker monsters are a mix of two animals instead of one, many of which are animals the original Shocker based their monsters on, which adds to the feeling we've been down this road before. Monsters like Scorpion Lizard, Mouse Condor, Centipede Tiger, Spider Lion, Cactus Bat. Meaning they're not just reusing Shocker's old ideas, but also Geldum's. And then there's Canary Cobra here. This is what I suspect Big Bird would look like if Sesame Street was made by Toei. Lava, lava, lava. They do have interesting designs, being a twisted blend of both animals, without one being more prominent than the other. The downside is I don't feel like they take advantage of this dual animal motif. Plots, characteristics, and even basic monster attacks typically focus on one animal instead of using both. Funny enough, the big exception is General Black himself. It's not shown off until his final appearance like the other generals, but when it happens, he manages to be the best example of this dual animal motif, making extensive use of both of his animal abilities as a leech chameleon. <laughs> yeah, I was surprised seeing the Chameleon Dead Man be introduced so early into Revice, given General Black is the final villain general of the original series. Regardless, this different yet similar approach the show takes to the Gel Shocker arc is a big reason why I feel Common Rider got rid of Ambassador Hell before he fulfilled his true potential. Imagine if he stuck around, leading the surviving members of the original Shocker against the great leader, General Black, and his Geldum forces. I don't want to make assumptions, but there might be people at Toei who agree with me, because that's basically what happens in Kamen Rider 1, a 2016 movie where Ambassador Hell comes back to life and does exactly that, lead a force of original generation Shocker loyalists against a splinter faction that includes Crab Bat as one of their monsters, no less. So what are the highlights of the Gal Shocker arc? I guess there's the way in which the general keeps his people loyal. Instead of childhood indoctrination or brainwashing, he gets his Gel Shocker combat men all hooked on a drug called Gelper, one they must take every three hours. Or else this happens. That's right, my dearest viewers. General Black is the female changeling, and the Gel Shocker combat men are Jem Hadar. By the way, Gelper is my final piece of evidence as to why the Common Rider Youth Squad is such a dangerous idea our heroes shouldn't be doing. Seeing as there's an episode where Black intends to drug them with Gelper so they'll become his Gel Shocker Youth Squad instead. On a more lighthearted note, another amusing moment happens in the battle with Canary Cobra, when out of nowhere, the monster for the next episode jumps in and is all, Hey, I know I'm early, but I want in on this fight too. Episode 84 is the first of the franchise to be directed by Shotaro Ishinomori personally. Toei had access to a helicopter when filming this episode, and boy does Ishinomori put it to use. His direction shows off he's a manga artist to the very core, as it features a lot of long establishing shots, and even when we have established a scene, there's lengthy periods without dialogue. The monster of the episode, appropriately enough, is the series' central theme in a nutshell, that being a lone individual struggling against an overwhelming force. The episode focuses mostly on him, switching back and forth from human and monster form as he struggles against the control device Gel Shocker put in his head. Surprisingly, this leads to a happy ending as this is one of the rare times when the monster is turned back to normal after being defeated, being able to reunite with his daughter. Does it undermine some of Hongo's early series brooding about how his conversion into a cyborg can't be undone? Yeah, a bit. Even with its discrepancy, the episode encapsulates everything Ishinomori envisioned Kamen Rider as being. His fingerprints are all over the place. Not only did Ishinomori direct the episode and design the monster, he's also killed by the monster when he makes a cameo appearance. It's less like your average Stan Lee cameo, and more like that scene in the Daredevil movie where Bullseye kills Frank Miller. As 1972 gave way to 1973, the series began the new year with another event. After Hongo destroys a monster in such a way that it looks like he also died, General Black unveils his new plan to reuse Shocker's very first plot, create a Kamen Rider. 
a three-parter that has a new monster in each episode as a bonus enemy to fight, the first Shocker Rider masquerades as Hongo in his absence, and it's pretty embarrassing how nobody recognizes his scarf, gloves, and boots are a different color. Except for Hayato, who notices right away when he enters the plot, making it all the more ridiculous that the supporting cast was fooled for an episode and a half. This aside, the Shocker Rider arc is well remembered for when Hongo and Hayato face off against six evil counterparts, leading to a first for the series, Hongo and Hayato transforming together for the first time, followed by the world's deadliest game of Ring Around the Rosie. Adding to all of this is a plot involving an anti-Shocker alliance seeking to learn the identity of the great leader. Unfortunately, this ends up being an extended take on the leader meeting that's really a trap plot we've seen before. It's got some strong build-up compared to the others. With a coordinated plan involving two of the monsters when one of them is captured, the other proceeds to kill and replace the leader of the alliance. Leading to the captured monster being let loose and killing everyone in the alliance headquarters. Meaning by the end of this three-parter, their numbers have dwindled down to just one of the guest stars. An exciting plot twist, though I just wish Hongo and Hayato fought the monsters and the Shocker Riders in the right order. The show has them fight the Shocker Riders, then the last monster, then roll credits, ending the episode before giving any real resolution to the Alliance's sole survivor. For that matter, why are we ending this on the monster fight? I feel like the fight with the Shocker Riders was a better fit for the final battle of this story. The monster is not the one Hongo and Hayato have been battling all three episodes. The silly training the pair underwent with Tachibana was to defeat the the Shocker Riders. They are the evil counterparts making the battle have more weight to it than a fight with a random slug mushroom monster that Gel Shocker tossed together in an afternoon. This is a famous moment in the original show's history and I'm talking about how flawed it is. That's gonna go over well with audiences. What I'm doing is arguably even more dangerous than the Anti-Shocker Alliance has fallen, but their fight is about to end all the same, as there's only four episodes of the show left. Two one-shots, and then the two-part finale, resulting in the final battle with General Black, one last fight with a squad of revived monsters, Racing Club being kidnapped for what feels like the umpteenth time, and the riders finally confront the great leader. Someone explain to me why he's dressed like a member of the KKK. Shocker and Gel Shocker have been a lot of things, but white supremacist is not one of them. Okay, yeah, we got Zol, who's literally a Nazi, but I don't remember him saying anything overtly racist or anti-Semitic. <clears throat> He speaks of human beings as if he isn't one, but that's technically true. Nazi cyborg werewolf, after all. We've gotten glimpses of their other branches around the world, and they don't discriminate by race or nationality, it would seem. Shinigami, for instance, is of mixed descent, being half Japanese, half Swiss, according to Toei. At the 2022 G-Fest, I learned Amamoto was fond of Switzerland. Maybe this aspect of Shinigami's character was his idea. If the villains hold any form of bigotry, it's of the fictional variety. The belief that cyborgs are superior to unmodified humans. Humans. I don't know. This design is probably just shorthand for bad guy. Gotta characterize him somehow. Have I really not talked about the Great Leader as a character up to this point? Probably because the Great Leader has been just a voice for the entire show before the last episode. He gave orders to the Monster of the Week directly prior to the Villain Generals, but once they showed up, the Great Leader started feeling redundant, some episodes having him speaking only a single line. The most exciting thing he did was abandon Shocker for Geldum without telling Hell about his plans, but that was interesting because of Hell's reaction rather than anything the Great Leader says or does. Leader meeting trap episodes are treated like a big deal with plenty of talk about learning the Great Leader's identity. Speculation that ends up going nowhere because we never meet any characters that could be potential suspects, and here at the end of the show, we only end up having more questions than answers. Despite the face-concealing helmets, you can tell Hongo and Hayato are looking at this guy and thinking, what the fuck? The Great Leader is the main villain of this show, and that's literally all anybody knows about him, both in and out of universe. Regardless of how much about the Great Leader is still a question mark, this is a satisfying end to the show. But that wasn't Toei's original plans. I don't know exactly when the changeover was made, but at some point, instead of ending here with the fall of Gel Shocker, the series would continue, introducing a new hero and villain faction. But rather than become episodes 99 and 100 of the original series, it instead became the first two episodes of Kamen Rider V3. I watched the two episodes for the purposes of this review, and when you go directly from the original show's finale to V3's premiere, it's a smooth transition. 
Almost like we're still watching the same show. We got our opening kill by the Monster of the Week, with a witness spotting the kill being hunted throughout the episode, Hongo and Tachibana being informed about the current plot during racing practice. There's even a decent amount of screen time given to Hongo as he discovers the villains have prematurely made a grave marker for him. Almost as if he's still the protagonist or something. Then it turns into a superhero origin story as the witness being targeted, Shiro Kazumi, is forced to watch as his family is murdered by a monster, giving us something we never got in the original show, an on-screen child death. After which, Shiro asks the writers to turn him into a cyborg, but they turn him down because they don't approve how he's motivated by revenge. That is until they learn the Great Leader is alive and well, now ruling over a third faction of villains, the Decepticons. Sorry, I mean Destron, which ends with Shiro helping them out of a trap, but is also mortally wounded in the process, leading the writers to ultimately grant his request and make Shiro the third Kamen Rider. Maybe I'll do a review of Kamen Rider V3 at some point in the future, but this script is getting long. The scripts for my anniversary videos are usually this long, but not my other content. I can only imagine how long the video is going to be, and how much of it I'm going to have to cut for brevity's sake. This was a strong start to a long-running series. It took a while to get through, there were periods of the same thing over and over again, and I have other minor gripes about the secondary cast, but I do recommend this series. It'll likely be very different to anyone who's only seen the Heisei or Reiwa era shows, but the skeleton of what you are likely familiar with is here. It's on par with Godzilla and Ultraman in terms of how important it is to the genre of tokusatsu as a whole and a big reason why Shinji Higuchi and Hideaki Anno were involved in a trilogy of movies that modernize all three in some way. They already did Shin Godzilla back in 2016, as well as last year's Shin Ultraman. And this year, Anno gave us Shin Kamen Rider. I'm lucky enough to have seen all these films in theaters, and they're pretty good modern reimaginings of tokusatsu's most influential figures. In addition to lovingly recreating shots from the original series' earliest episodes, Shin Kamen Rider has some very interesting twists on what we saw in the original series. Hongo's genuinely disturbed by the blood on his hands, which I can't say I blame him as the gore effects are more convincing in 2023 than they ever were in 1971 while Hayato is given the hero's journey that the original show basically skipped over. Without spoiling, let's just say the movie makes a meta joke with regards to Fujioka's accident requiring him to be temporarily replaced. In addition to keeping their unique looks, they also receive cool trench coats, which is a nice touch as they spend more time on their motorcycles than any of the riders we see on TV these days. Ruriko is given a much bigger role in the film and is a stronger character overall. Not to mention the film expands the ties she and her family has with Shocker, while Hiromi has become the film's version of Wasp Woman. Speaking of which, the monsters genuinely are cyborgs wearing costumes, which ground their cybernetic nature while still embracing some of the 70s era cheesiness that was inevitably going to be in this film. The audience's laughter when I went to see Shin Kamen Rider can attest to that. One of the most, let's say, interesting changes Shin Kamen Rider makes is how the great leader appears to have been switched out for a brand new character that has more in common with Kamen Rider Black villain Shadow Moon. Which is good because there's more that can be done story-wise with a character like Shadow Moon. Cause if we're being real here, the Great Leader was more of a plot device than anything else. Maybe if we're lucky, Anno and Higuchi will team up again to make more films like this. Such as a Shin Himitsu Sentai Go Ranger someday. Or Shin Space Sheriff Gavin. Or maybe even Shin Gamera. Now as for my next review, that will involve talking about another very influential figure in tokusatsu. One the genre just would not be the same without. Spider-Man!